There's a story I came across this week. It was about a, a little boy in Texas. Uh, actually, it was about a pastoral family in Texas. The, the father preaches almost every week in this small Texas church. They're from Texas, so they got that lovely southern, southern drawl. It was an interesting story because the, the mother apparently struggles a little bit uh, while her husband is preaching. She often sits in the front row and struggles with their three- or four-year-old son who is very precocious, right? He's all over the place. Uh, as, as a pastor's wife, you often feel like the whole church is looking at you, mostly because the whole church is looking at you. And um, she felt that on this one particular occasion. Usually she could get the boy to quiet down by just telling him that she could offer him treats afterwards or scolding him or whatever. But on this one occasion, he was just not... He was not behaving. In fact, he was trying to interrupt his father half the time. While the father was preaching, he was waving, Dad, 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 watch. And he was doing dances and things. So the mother was just done. She picked the boy up and put him over her shoulder and said, wait till we get out in the lobby, right? And so she walked down the, the aisle of the church, the middle aisle of the church, and this little boy climbed up on her mother's shoulders and said, y'all pray for me now. Our prayers tend to reveal our priorities, right? And you and I pray about the stuff that is the most uh, immediately affecting us. So, so if you sit in a prayer meeting in the Western world these days anyway, usually the prayers are about this, the stuff that's plaguing us. And by plaguing, I actually mean usually physical infirmity, right? I mean, it's usually, uh, I have a bad foot, uh, my, my mother's got a, a bad arm, or uh, they're dealing with sickness in this particular way, and would you heal? And that's because we, we tend to have a priority for physical health, understandably, and it's a good priority to have. People's lives will be help, helpfully, uh, will be helped by, by having physical health and well-being or financial um, well-being. It's interesting, though, that when you look at some of, the, some of the prayers of the Bible, though, especially the prayers of the Apostle Paul, he doesn't really approach it that way. He doesn't, you don't find prayers about, you know, healing feet or these sorts of, what you find when he prays for these churches is he tends to pray for really spiritual stuff, that their hearts would be enlightened and that, they're, that they would know the love of God. And his, his approach here is basically, look, if, if your heart can be changed, if your spiritual life can be changed, what will happen is it will give you a framework and it will give you a perspective on all those other physical infirmities and things that are happening in your, in your life as a result. So what you find is him talking in kind of exalted language sometimes in his prayers for, for his churches. He starts most of his books with most of the letters with, with prayers. So in Philippians 1, verse 9, he says, And this is my prayer, that your love, Philippians, may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Or Ephesians 1, 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. See what he does there? It's a, a change of heart is going to change someone's actions. Well, the same thing happens in the book of Philemon. Paul's going to pray for this guy, this letter that is being delivered to Philemon through the hand of his former slave Onesimus. If you don't know the story of this, this book, I gave a little bit of it last week, okay? So let me give a recap. Philemon is a wealthy man who uh, hosts the church in Colossae, a small town. He hosts the church in his house. He's well known around the community. He owns a slave, and he's a faithful Christian. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, how can those two phrases go together? You should probably listen to this sermon last week where I talked a lot about the Bible and slavery and how those things, those things function. But let's just move past that for the minute. What happened was this, this Christian man, Philemon, who hosted the church in his house and had Onesimus, as his slave. Onesimus decides one night or one day that he doesn't want to be a slave anymore. Something happened, perhaps. And before he leaves, he goes and he steals a whole bunch of stuff out of Philemon's house so that the morning, perhaps, that they wake up, Mrs. Philemon is looking around and saying, well, the candlesticks are gone and all of our silver. 
things out of the safe. They're all, they're all missing. And so is Onesimus. So they connect the dots. He stole from us and he's a runaway slave. And so he takes off. Of course, Onesimus does. He takes off as far away as he can get. Goes to Rome, 2,500 kilometers away. Hopefully never to be seen from again. He's got lots of stuff he can sell so that he can fund his trip. And he gets to Rome and he's there for a while. We don't know what he was doing. But eventually he ends up running across the path of Paul who was under house arrest in Rome at the same time. And the two are introduced to each other, and Paul preaches the gospel to this man, and this man believes it. So now, instead of just being Philemon's former slave, he's also Philemon's brother in Christ. But he's 2,500 kilometers away, and he becomes Paul's gopher, basically. He goes around, and he tries to provide the things that Paul needs, uh, maybe some clothing or some food on particular occasions. Sometimes he delivers some letters to churches. And eventually, Onesimus decides that he's going to share his secret with Paul. And maybe he sits him down by the fire one day in that house where Paul's under house arrest and says, listen, Paul, I've been kind of living a lie here. And it's been bugging me. You see, the reason I'm in Rome is because I, I'm a runaway slave. And the reason that I have all the money to provide for the resources that are now feeding you or fed me before I came to faith in Christ was because I stole a bunch of stuff from my former slave owner. And my former slave owner's name is Philemon, and he's kind of a leader in a church in Colossae. And Paul, when these, these things are said, all of the light bulbs go on in his head, and he says, I know Philemon. He's a dear friend. He's a fellow worker I know the church in Colossae. In fact, I've been writing a letter to them. And so Paul is faced with the challenge. He has an old friend, an old fellow follower of Jesus, and he's got a new friend, fellow follower of Jesus, and they are at odds with one another. In fact, the one, Onesimus, has wronged Philemon in the deepest way, stolen from him. But they're 2,500 kilometers apart, and so what's he supposed to do? What would you do? I mean, I, I know what i do. I'd say, dude, 2,500, Rome's a long way away from Colossae. You're never going to run across each other at Costco. <laughs> so you just stay here, and he'll stay there, and no one will be the wiser. But Paul's not, he's, no, that's not sufficient for people who are in the family of God. They've got to sort it out. So he sends Onesimus back. Onesimus goes back. He, said, he says, I'm not going to send you empty-handed. I want you to bring this letter with you. I wrote a special one for you. Put your name on the top of it. Onesimus. It's to Philemon. Hand it to him. When he sees you and he's really angry, put it in his hands. So he does. Onesimus travels those 2,500 kilometers back. He ends up getting the letter. He puts it in Philemon's hands, who of course would be angry at seeing the man who had just stolen all sorts of stuff from them and is a former slave and probably deserves beatings or death or whatever it was that they did in those days for that. But before he can execute judgment upon this man who's wronged him, he opens the letter and he starts to read. It's addressed to him. It's addressed to his family. It's supposed to be read out in front of the entire church. Paul says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he jumps into a prayer in verse 4. And this is how that prayer goes. I always thank my God as I remember you, Philemon, in my prayers. Because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus, I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. So listen, what I want to do, before we get into the guts of the letter and the reason that he wrote it in the next couple of weeks, what I want to do today is I just want to take that prayer and I want to zoom in on it. And I want to ask the question, what do we learn about God, about our relationships from Paul's prayer for Philemon? And there are four things that I'm going to point out here. I wish I could have made them more pithy than I did, but oh well. Uh, here they are. I think we learn that we need to give thanks for the good. Number two, be known for the right things. Third, rejoice when God uses someone else. And four, understand your obligations. 
Give thanks for the good, be known for the right things, rejoice when God uses someone else, or un- and understand your obligation. So we'll use that as our outline. Here's the first of those. Give thanks for the good. Look at verse four again. I just read it. Verse four and five. I always, says Paul to Philemon, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Do you have a difficult friend? I'm sure you, a, a difficult spouse, don't nod. Don't, don't do that. A diff, somebody, a Christian brother or sister, somebody who's related to you in some way, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your boss, maybe it's your employee, maybe, somebody in your life who is, who is difficult. Some of you are like, yeah, that's everybody, okay. Then picture everybody in your life, and I want you to think for a minute. Okay, so you know all of the issues that you have with that particular person. You know the things that you want to see change in their life. And those things that you might want to see change in their life might be really noble things. I mean, they're young in the faith, and they need to grow in the faith, or they act immature in all of their life, and they need to develop into these things. And so when you sit down and you pray for your friend, your spouse, your kids, your boss, when you sit down and you pray for your Christian brother and sister, what kinds of things do you pray about when it comes to that difficult person? Do you have a mental checklist in your mind about the five different things that need to be changed and you come to the Lord and say, Lord, here's the deal. You know Joe, you know Ezra. I have five issues. I have five issues with him. And these are, these are them. Fix, 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 fix. And then we'll all be happy. Or when you come to God and you pray about your difficult Ezra, you, do you say... Do you say to the Lord, Lord, I just want to thank you for the evidences of your grace I see in his life. And here they are. I get, honestly, I'll tell you, I do the first. (laughs) I I, I always come to the Lord and I say, these are are the the problems, Lord. You, You need to fix these problems. I don't really give thanks for his grace in their lives as much. And yet that's exactly what you find Paul starting with when he prays for Philemon, isn't it? I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Man, you're amazing. Your faith toward God and Christ and your love for people, it's all I hear about. I'm so thankful. Guys, Philemon was not a perfect man. I'm sure that Paul knows about issues in his life that are not good, but when he starts to pray about the man, he prays for the things he sees that are positive. This is kind of Paul's MO. This is his habit. So in the book of Corinthians, I said that that Paul uh, begins many of his letters with prayers. In the book of 1 Corinthians, he he begins with a prayer that's really interesting if you know a whole lot about Paul's relationship with the Corinthians. It was not a great relationship. Paul was an apostle. They doubted that very much because he didn't show all the showings of other people who claimed to be apostles. We have a correspondence between them. 1 Corinthians is one of the letters Paul sends. 2 Corinthians is another. There's another letter that we, that's called the harshly worded letter. There's points at which in the correspondence where Paul says, I don't even know if you guys are Christians. Like maybe you should test yourselves to see whether or not you're even in the faith. They got all sorts of trouble in their church. All sorts of things that Paul identifies, but when he starts talking about them, he's got a litany, a whole list of things that he could address. God fix these things with this church, but what, how does he start? 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. I can see God moving in your midst, Corinthians, and I give thanks to him for what I see. That's remarkable. It's a good practice, in fact, to look for ways God is working in others and give thanks for what you see. My daughter has been taking piano. It's her first year. She's not great yet. 
I think about those, those classes that she takes. I, I love listening to her play piano. It's fantastic to see the develop and all that. But she, I think about the classes that she takes with this lovely piano teacher. In fact, I think about this piano teacher as she's sitting there with all of these students. She's very sweet and kind and affirming in these things. But I will, I will tell you, that it would be odd for her not to be. Can you imagine a piano teacher who would sit next to the student and every time the student makes an error in their first year, they're like, that's awful. What did you do there? See, your hands are wrong. So put your hands right. Sit up straight. Make sure that you get this one. And as soon as they play whatever, you know, chopsticks or Mozart's whatever, and they, they start playing along and they make a mistake. Stop, stop, stop. My ears are hurting. You're killing me. You're taking years off my life, you student. Of course they would never do this. And the reason they would never do this is because a piano teacher understands that that is a learner. And that because they're a learner, there are gonna be mistakes, they're gonna stink at it for a little while. Eventually they'll, they'll get better. But they're a learner. You know what the word disciple means? Literally, it means learner. Which should Make clear to you and to me that some of the people in our lives who we have difficult times with, some of the Christian brothers and sisters around, it's difficult sometimes because they're learning, just like you're learning. And that our job is not to come down on them at every moment and saying, wrong, 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 wrong. Here's the litany of things that I don't agree with in your life and blah, blah, blah. And I'm telling God about it. That's, that's not the approach that we take. Ultimately, the approach we take is what Paul does. Can I just tell you the things that I see happening in your life that are evidences of the Spirit of God moving? My son is in um, the youth group here, and uh, he was given a card recently from one of his youth, youth leaders. I'm kind of sneaky. I, I don't tell him, but I like sometimes take those cards and read what's said. <laughs> Do you know, does this youth leader know something that I don't know? You know, so I, I took the card, and I, I read it quietly, I know my son. I, I think he's phenomenal. Like, I think he's one of the best people I've ever met in my entire life. He's got such a rich future ahead of him in so many ways. Thank God for him. But I also know his issues. It's like you know your kid's issues. And I have a list of them that sometimes I bring to God. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> I was wondering, as I read this thing, is this, how's this youth leader going to approach some of the issues that I'm sure that he sees in my son as well? But this youth, I started reading it, and the youth leader started talking about, can I just tell you, about all the ways that I see God working in your life and all the ways that God is doing these things. I finished the thing and I was like, oh, you're a better father than I am, right? <laughs> but isn't that beautiful? Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? So listen, how is it that you treat the difficult person in your life, that spouse? Nag, 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 nag. God, fix all those things. Is that the way you pray? But listen, you should pray about the things that they struggle with, but not until you've prayed about the ways that he's working in their lives that you can see. Give thanks. God's at work. They're learning. So give thanks for the good. Second, be known for the right thing. Verse four and five again, just want to focus on something a little different that we see in these two verses. He says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. People whisper about you behind your back, Philemon, such that I hear about it. And what I hear is that you're faithful and you love people. That's what they say. But you're famous, man. For your faithfulness and, and your love. That's what people are saying about you. I was uh, at a conference a number of years ago. It was a denominational conference. You go to these conferences and they give you your, you check in, they give you your lanyard, you know, your necklace there, and they put your name on the, the little paper in it. And it says, Jeff Bucknam, Northview Community Church. Well, we had to get our bags up to our room. It was a bit of a high rise. And so we walked into the elevator and just before the, the door shut, some guy's hand reached in and opened the elevator back up. It was me, Ezra was with me, a couple of our pastors were with me, and we were standing kind of against the back wall facing this guy, just leaning on our suitcases. 
And he walked in and he faced us with his back to the door and he looked at our name tags, da, 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 and he got to mine and he looked at it and he said, Jeff Bucknam, oh, Northview. Okay. <laughs> and he turned around and faced the door. His, his floor came and he got out and he closed the door. And I was like, I turned to Ezra. I said, what? And he goes, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Well, what, what did he know about me? What are they saying about me behind my back? Some people are obsessed with that question, are they not? What are they saying? What am I known for? What are you known for? What do people whisper when you go by? How do you want to be remembered? Every year, the elders of our church do a 360-degree review of me, and they ask our pastors and others, uh, what do you think of Jeff? And no, there's not a sign-up for this, all right? <laughs> they ask questions of people who know me, and, and they end up saying things. They're always anonymous. Hey, these are what some of the pastors are saying. A lot of this stuff's really positive, and some of it's like, not, it's not positive. And they sit me down in a room, and they give that kind of review. If, if, if Philemon... We're given that kind of review. I'm sure there are things about him that wouldn't have been positive, but the overriding elements of his life that are being whispered around, about behind his back are, brother, you, you, you love people. Like you love the church. And your faith in Jesus is remarkable. That's what people talk about is you're just your faithfulness to him. Those are things worth being known for, aren't they? Is that the kind of thing that they whisper about you? Is that, is that what you're pursuing? Because you know, we're all pursuing something, yes? All of us are chasing after something that people will whisper when we go by. They're, we're chasing after something that we'll be remembered for. My wife and I went to a wedding. I was in a wedding, actually, a number of years ago. I was in the Seattle area, and my, uh, my friend was getting married, and his wife's family had some means, and so they rented out this enormous, beautiful uh, airplane museum, actually, just south of Seattle, for the reception. And so I arrived. I was wearing a, a, a coat and, and tie, and as you can I, I mean, I make it look good. So, like, I showed, up, I showed up with this coat and tie, and my wife, who's a petite blonde woman, was standing next to me. Now, some people have told me in the past that I look like John Travolta. And especially at that time in my life, it was like in the 90s, and so apparently he was still on, on the movies and stuff, and apparently I looked like Travolta a little bit. I hadn't shaved for a little bit, you know, and, and so showed up at this, at this party, and I didn't know at the time that John Travolta's wife was a petite blonde woman. And so we walked in to the coat check where there was a woman standing there waiting for our coats. And as soon as I took my coat off and I handed it to her, I looked her in the eye, she looked me and they went, oh. I love you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> and she looked at my wife and she said, oh, and I love you. Oh, did you, I can't, but, oh. And, she, and so I gave her my coat and I, I was like, this is really weird, she said. And she started listing off some movies that she liked of mine. And I was like, okay, those are all Travolta movies. Oh, she thinks I'm John Travolta, right? So anyway. Didn't correct her, I went into the thing. <laughs> I came back, I came back to get my, my coat at the end, right? My wife's with me, and I said to her, Teeny, what's gonna happen here? And she's, I don't know. So he walked up, and she was like, oh, 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 can you just, before you go, can you just, you know, here's a paper, and can you sign this paper and stuff? And I'm, at this point, I'm like, yeah, okay. Right? <laughs> so, John Travolta. <laughs> I keep thinking this girl's got this great story. She probably has this thing, you know, uh, framed and on her wall and has this story. Did you know that John Travolta, I once checked his coat somewhere in the world. But I remember the feeling I had was I walk, when I walked in, when she thought that I was John Travolta and she like thought I was amazing and I walked out and she was whispering it to the other people behind the counter there about how great John Travolta, I felt this like, hmm, that's right, I'm close to John Travolta, you know, and I wa walked through. Everybody wants something like that, don't you? You want to have that feeling that when you walk through the store, they turn the heads and say, oh, there goes Joe. There goes Susan. She's so great because she's, what is that thing? 
What is that thing? Fill in the blank. What, what is that thing that you want to be called great for? Some, some people, the answer to that is, I want to be called beautiful. And you invest most of your time and energy in that thing. You usually know it's the thing you're investing your time in and the thing you care mostly about and the thing you want to be remembered for. You usually know it because when you lose it, you're crushed. And some of you, it's, it's, it's wealth, it's power in my company and success so that people say, you're a great chicken farmer, you're a great businessman, you're a great developer, look at what you've done. People talk about you behind your back in these positive, positive ways. Listen, if you asked God what's worth pursuing, what should they say about me, Lord? I'm pretty sure that he would point to people like Philemon and say, Faith in the Lord Jesus and love for the saints. That's worth it. These three remain. Faith, hope, and love. So give thanks for the good. Be known for the right things. I want to skip verse 6 and I want to go to verse 7. Here's the third thing we learn from this passage. Rejoice when God uses someone else. So Paul is still praising Philemon, and at the end of the prayer, he, he, he says this, your love, Philemon, has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Like I, I'm thrilled and I have great joy in my heart because of what you're doing. Your ministry is refreshing the Lord's people. He's celebrating the ministry of, of another guy. So um, my mother was Canadian, uh, Prince Edward Island, and uh, I, because I was born after she had to get rid of her Canadian citizenship, I, I was an American. I'm just now uh, in the process of getting citizenship in Canada, so you're welcome again, right? <laughs> now, I'm really excited about it, but one of the things that she tried to pass on to me when I was young, and I never actually caught until now, was a love for corner gas. Uh, <laughs> I didn't get it for a long time. I moved to Canada, and it's, it's awesome. Yes, this is an awesome show, Corner Gas. Dog River, Saskatchewan. There's this thing that happens in Corner Gas. When they mention the town that's nearest them, the town that should not be named, it's called Woolerton. And whenever they say Woolerton, they go, Pff, right? Well, he's from Woolerton, all right? So he's from Langley, Pff, right? I get whatever. He's, There are churches that elicit that kind of response to other churches. You know that. That, 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 that when we mention their name, <laughs> pastors, when we mention it, <laughs> they're not usually doctrinally incorrect. They're not churches that have got it wrong on a lot of things. It's just that the Lord is using them in ways that maybe our church isn't having an impact right now. And so as a result, what we do is we say their name, say the pastor's name, and <laughs> What I find remarkable about what Paul does here is he, he celebrates the ministry of another pastor. I am thrilled. I have joy, Philemon, because you are refreshing the hearts of the Lord's people. I, I don't have anything to do with it, but, but you do. See, Paul's attitude was that he saw himself on the same team working toward the same end. And if the end was achieved, it was something worth celebrating. So you get a passage, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul's dealing with the Corinthians at this point who loved their rock star preachers. They used to say stuff like, I'm of Apollos. Oh, Apollos is so phenomenal. I have his picture on my wall. Apollos. I'm on the Apollos team. Well, I'm of Paul. You know, he's the real apostle. And I'm of Christ, says another. There's always one in every group. I, I'm of Jesus. I'm of Peter. They had their, their little groups. And they competed against each other. Well, Paul's done more, and Apollos has done more, and blah, 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 blah. They're all fighting against each other, you see. And I have a favorite. When Paul is dealing with this issue, he says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5, he says, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? 
They're only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. See, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. And so this attitude frees Paul. Look, I'm all about the goal. The growth, the glory to God through the growth and the edification of the church. And if somebody else is doing that and I'm not doing it, that's reason for praise. And if I'm doing it and someone else isn't doing it, it's reason for praise. Because the goal is the growth and the glory to God. Not to me. This is a thing that many of us probably could learn in the church. This joy of seeing God working in the lives and through the lives of, of, of others. I had lunch this week with a dear friend, Matt, who worked with me when I was a young adults pastor here. And the Lord took him on a rocky journey that led him ultimately to be the pastor of Central Church in Chilliwack. And Matt was telling me stories, regaling me with stories over lunch about how God is moving in that church, how people are coming to faith in Jesus there, how people who are in faith in Jesus there are growing deeper. He's like, dude, my church is filled with all sorts of people who are kind of new to the faith now. And there's a guy, in fact, who sits in the third row during church, and he just came to faith in Christ, but he doesn't know the rules for church. And so... He said, I keep my, my phone on me when I'm, when I'm preaching sometimes. And he said, sometimes it'll buzz in the middle of the service. And this guy will be like waving it, like pointing at it like, hey, I'm texting you right now, right? <laughs> That's like, so what, do you, what do you want me to do? He reads it later and it says, my wife is poking me in the ribs. That was a good point, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> He said, but he doesn't know. He doesn't know that that's kind of just, wait, brother, until the he's new at it. And it's so great to see. He's regaling me stories about the way they're replanting churches in their region and their vision to do this all around Canada. And I'm telling that's our vision. And, uh. While he was telling me these things, I just, my heart was swelling with joy. I have nothing to do with any of that. But my heart is refreshed because the saints are being refreshed through your ministry, brother. I've told you before that, that um, I am basically the product of the discipling intent of a man named Ken Hutcherson, a big black former football player who just passed away a few years ago. He's a pastor of Antioch Bible Church in the Seattle area. When I ended up becoming the pastor here through a series of circumstances, I decided I'd go back down to the Redmond area where his, in the east side of Seattle where, he, my, where his church is, church about 3,000 people. I, I came in to the door wondering if he was even going to recognize me. He stands at the door and greets people. And when he saw me coming, he kind of scrunched up his forehead and was like, hmm, who's that? And I came up to him and said, Hutch, do you remember me? And then it just light bulb went off and he went, Jeff, brother, bring it in. And he's big old bear hug. And how's it been going? And that's all I just started telling him. This is what the Lord's done in my life. This is what's happened. I'm the pastor of this church up in Canada now. And this is what the Lord's doing in Canada. I talked way too much. Right? Like, because Nor- Dorothy's like my, one of my kids. I just talk too much. It's great, and it's this and that. All the things. He's like, okay, I've got to go preach now. He told me, okay, I'm sorry. I went up and I sat down, way at the back with my wife and kids. He does this thing at the beginning of the service where he kind of walks around the aisles of the, of the church and he, and he just says, so this week at church, we're going to have this and this, all these kind of things. And he gave about two minutes of announcement and then he stopped right in the middle of the room because he caught my eye in the back. He saw me sitting in the back. And he said, Jeff, can you stand up, son? Which, by the way, is your greatest fear. Is it not when you come in here that I will do this to you sometime? Dale, stand up, brother, right? Yeah. So I'm standing there. I'm like, oh, dear. <laughs> So I stood up, you know, and how do you, what do you do with your hands? And like, and he, uh, he said to everyone, can I just tell you a story about this young man? And he started to talk about how I came to his house on a Monday night. My mom used to drop me off when I was 15 years old. A discipleship group that I was part of for five to five years and ended up going off to college and eventually seminary and youth pastor work and young adult pastor work and then teaching pastor work and then lead pastor work. And I'm now in Canada. He told the entire story and with tears in this man's eyes, he said, brothers and sisters, this is the fruit of my labor. I am. And the joy in this man's heart toward something for the ministry of another. Isn't this the way it ought to be in the church? That as long as God's name is proclaimed and as long as the saints are being refreshed, 
We give praise. That's a win. All right, last one. Understand your obligations. I skip verse 6. Because it's the core, basically, of the rest of the book. And I want to leave you thinking about the rest of the book. Listen to what he's praying. So all the other things that he said in this prayer were all thanksgivings, right? This is his prayer for Philemon. This is what I'm praying about for you, brother. I pray, verse 6, that your partnership with us, important word, partnership, your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. What's he saying? Well, this word partnership is the Greek word koinonia. There are people in the church today who, who call their community groups koinonia groups because they're, they're, the word's usually translated fellowship. But the problem is when we call stuff like that koinonia groups, what you think koinonia means is sitting around a table with like bunt cake and coffee and awkwardly answering questions with people you don't really know. That's kind of what koinonia is, but not in its fullness. Koinonia is a generous commitment on behalf of Christians for other Christians. So when, when the Apostle Paul, when the, when the Apostle Paul is in prison and the church in Philippi says, we can't let you be in prison, Paul, without help, so they send him Epaphroditus, and Paul writes the book of Philippians back. He says, I want to thank you for your partnership, for your koinonia in the gospel. And what he means is, I want to thank you for your active, sacrificial generosity toward me, who's a member of your family, that you didn't say, Paul's in prison, that's his problem. Instead, you said, no, he's our brother in Christ, and so it's, it is our problem. One commentator said that maybe the best way to understand the full-orbed sense of koinonia in the modern world is to, is to, de to describe it the way a, a teammate relates to another teammate. My son plays baseball, and so uh, one of the things that happens in baseball is, is bench-clearing brawls every once in a while. Baseball's kind of boring at times, and so when everyone gets up and runs at each other, you're like, ooh, what's going on there? Usually what happens is the pitcher got mad, and he threw a ball at the head of the, the batter, and the batter took issue with that, and so he throws his bat down and starts marching out toward the mound. But both teams don't view that and say, well, this is just a fight between that pitcher and that batter. Not my problem. Instead, what they say is, oh, it's on. And it doesn't matter if your guy was in the right or in the wrong, he's on your team, and therefore you're in. And you're in their old chesty, yelling at each other, and it's great, love baseball, right? But that commitment, that's, that's koinonia. The idea that says what you do to somebody in my team, what you do to somebody in my family, you do it to me. And so what is Paul trying to say here to Philemon? He's saying, basically, look, I'm praying for you that, that this team-like, this teammate-like commitment that you have toward other Christians will effectively help you know how far this sharing in Christ ought to go. In other words, I want to take that teammate-like mentality and help you understand that there are some people now who are part of your team who you didn't expect to be part of your team. He's so setting him up. I'm praying that when you learn that Onesimus is actually a believer in the Lord Jesus and that he's a member of your family, that your koinonia, your teammate-like thinking, will bear some fruit in your forgiveness of the man. Doug Moo, one of the commentators, he talks about this idea. He says, when, when, when people believe in Christ, they become identified with one another in an intimate association and incur both the benefits and responsibilities of that communion. Philemon is fundamentally, the book is fundamentally all about those responsibilities as Paul, Onesimus, and Philemon, bound together in faith, are forced by circumstances to think through the radical implications of their koinonia. Or in other words, to be a Christian is to be intimately associated with other Christians. And there are some benefits of that, but there are some obligations that come with it. So let me finish by just giving you a couple of the obligations that you and I have as brothers and sisters in Christ to other members of our spiritual family. One of them is material. We have material obligations to one another, the scriptures say. 
So Paul, for example, when the church in, in, in Jerusalem is very poor and under famine, he ends up going around to all the other churches in the Mediterranean world at the time, and he visits them, and he says, listen, they're suffering at the present time, and so you brothers and sisters need to give to help them. He comes to the Corinthian church, in fact, in 2 Corinthians 8. He says, at the present time, your plenty, Corinthians, will supply what they need so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. See, the goal is equality. God in his providence has provided for you in the present time so that you can share with them. And there might be a time later on that they have so that they can share with you. The goal is equality because that's the way families function, yes? When you look across and you say, oh, that, that person's a member of my family, you, there's an obligation you have to them. I'm talking to my brother-in-law recently. He's, he's got a, a brother who's not related to me, but I was talking to him and he was, he was saying, oh, we're trying to buy a new house so that we can house my, my, my brother. And the reason is because my brother doesn't have a job. And when he was telling me this, I thought, this is really good for you. But I, when he was saying it to me, I felt no obligation whatsoever to his to his brother. Why? Because he's not part of my family. But my, my friend Doug, he, he is a part of his family. And the reason he's going to care for him is because of that. Ezra sends money back to his parents every month back in Africa. And sometimes a week after he sends the money for the month, he gets an email saying or a phone call saying, we need more money. And Ezra says, why do you need more money? And his mom says, listen, your uncle came and something happened and he came and asked for money and I gave it. And Ezra's like, why did you give it? It was for you. And she says, what was I supposed to say, Ezra? No, he's family. So you know, we have an obligation materially to our family. When they need, we jump. You wonder why it is that we talk about multiplication and I stand up here and say, let's plant churches all over the place in North India and Thailand and let's plant churches all around Canada. It's because there are people living in towns in Canada, Christian brothers and sisters, who do not have a faithful church they can attend. You do. So you who have, have a responsibility and obligation to help those who do not, that there may be equality. It's a material obligation to brothers and sisters in Christ. And finally, there's a relational obligation that we have. There's a, there's a relationship that we're supposed to foster with one another. And this is really what Philemon's ultimately about. What I mean by a relational obligation is what P Jesus said in Luke 17, verse 3. He says, if your brother or sister, notice the language. If your family member, your spiritual family member, if your brother and sister sins against you, rebuke them. That's your business. It's your business to be involved in their life and you're them involved in yours. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you and say, I repent, you must forgive them. See, I owe it to my brothers and sisters to keep short accounts. Is that the way that we, we function, brothers and sisters, in the Christian church? Is it? Do we keep short accounts with each other and are quick to forgive? God, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. What I think is that you and I have relational dust-ups a lot. And when we have those dust-ups, what we do is we shut the door on that person and we avoid them. And when we see them in Costco, we go to that far wall with the dishwashers. Because I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with that person. Is that what Paul does with Onesimus and Philemon? 2,500 kilometers apart? Does he say, don't worry about it. You guys will probably never see each other again. You should come back. You can hear the rest of the story. Before you do, though, let me just finish with this. My, my mother used to say, every, every Mother's Day, I'd say to her, her mom, what can I get you for Mother's Day? Because I'm a boy and I haven't got a clue of that, answer that. What can I get you for Mother's Day? And she'd say the same thing every year. Honey, I just want my children to get along. <laughs> and in those words, she was, she was echoing the words of our God about his family. So come back and find out what that looks like. Let me pray. Father, so thankful for your grace and for this word. And
this book. And I pray, Father, that you continue to help us to understand it more and more and its implications more and more as we jump in next time to what this looks like, this koinonia. We're thankful for you. In Jesus' name, amen.